This episode of the DSP Project is brought to you by PMC, Ultimate Speakers, and Prime Acoustic, take control of your room. Hello and welcome to the DSP Project, your weekly fix of music production and technology. I am your host Rupert Brown and this week we're starting uh, the first episode in a series we will be doing on studio monitors. I decided to upgrade the monitoring system we have here in the DSP Project Studio and I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk to you about how to make a good decision when buying new monitors and also how to get the most out of them and out of your existing monitors as well as well as the good people at Prime Acoustic have given us a great prize to give away to get, the, to get a better sound out of your room and again get your monitors sounding better. Um, so stick around and I will give details for that at the end of this episode. First off though, I want to talk, uh, talk through some basics, um, just cover a few kind of terms so that we're all kind of on a level playing field um, about studio monitors. Now, so from the very start, studio monitors are basically just speakers, just loudspeakers. Um, the, the term monitor, uh, when I started out f over 10 years ago, I remember reading about studio monitors and thinking it was talking about uh, screen, <laughs> screens, which is uh, a bit embarrassing, but true. Generally, you want, from a studio monitor, you want something that's, that's honest and tells you what is going on in the audio as opposed to something that is hyped and sounds nice. Um, and so in order to get that, we look for monitors that have a flat frequency response, meaning the, uh, the bass and the mids and the trebles all come out at about the same level, as opposed to getting a speaker where you might get uh, the, the bass that might be emphasized on certain speakers. And um, the, the problem with that being that if you have monitors in your studio that emphasize the bass, you might be putting a track together and uh, the kick sounds really nice and meaty. You can hear all the bass because of that emphasis, but that bass isn't actually in your music. That's just been added by the speaker. Uh, the, the issue then comes when you take it out of your studio and put it on another system that doesn't emphasize the bass. Um, and then you'll find that uh, it sounds really flat and, you, and you're missing, you're like, where's that chunky kick gone? It's disappeared. Um, it's because what you're hearing wasn't actually in the, in the audio, it was something that, that was added by your speakers. Uh, and that's the biggest problem with if you were just using like any old hi-fi, if you've got some Sony system with a Mega X bass turbo expansion <laughs> button on it and, uh, you're, and you're listening to your music through that or making music through that, you're not really hearing what's going on in the, the music. You're hearing all this extra stuff that the, uh, that the speakers and or stereo is adding to it. So when we talk about um, uh, playing it from, moving it from one system and putting it on another, uh, we talk about translation, and that's basically what we're talking about. So when someone says their, their, their mix translates very well to other systems, it means that um, it sounds good in their, their home system, but then also when you put it in a car, put it in an iPod, play it on the, the crappy speakers in the kitchen, that it should still have a, a good balance to it. Um, and, and again, that's where it comes to having true and honest speakers as opposed to speakers that sound nice. Um, that's where you get good translation. Um, active and passive are another terms you might hear of, active studio monitors. Active monitors basically just means that the amplifier is built into the speaker itself. This is uh, definitely my preference for speakers and seems to be the way that it's going. Most studio monitors are active. Um, the advantages of getting a, an active speaker is obviously, you know, the manufacturer is going to supply you with an amp that is going to be very well coupled to the, the speaker. Plus, you don't need to worry about the interconnect between the amp, the cabling interconnect between the amplifier and the speaker itself. Plus, you don't have a, an amplifier that you've got to then make room for and, and store somewhere. So, active speakers are definitely my, uh, definitely my preference. Um, Another important fact that I want to hammer home that I'll get, I'll sort of get on the soapbox about later, is uh, again talking about acoustics and what a huge impact the room you're in has on the sound that you hear. So, if you have um, if you have a really expensive pair of monitors and you put them into a small un, uh, untreated room, they're probably going to sound like crap no matter how expensive they are because the the reflections inside the room have a huge have a huge part to play in what you hear and uh, like I say I'm going to elaborate on that more but just to you know that is a point that I'm going to be um, harping on about is the importance of the acoustics in the room 
Um, another important point uh, about studio monitors uh, is that it's definitely a personal thing. It's a, it's a taste. There's no best monitor. Um, there they just, just isn't. It, is, it really is uh, a personal preference thing. Even when you get, again, getting to really expensive monitors costing, you know, 10,000 plus pounds, um, you'll, you'll find people that just don't like the sound of them and some people that swear by them. So it, it really is something that you can't just take somebody else's opinion for. Which leads me into my next point about purchasing monitors, which is the number one rule above everything else, is listen to them first. Really, really you do need to hear them for yourself. Um, there's a lot of opinions and stuff on the internet and it's, you know, sometimes there's some really good advice out there, but there's also a lot of not so great advice and conflicting advice and um, particularly with monitors, it does, again, it's a personal thing. What sounds best to you will not sound best to somebody else, so you do need to hear it. Now, if you're um, not lucky enough to be in a town where you have a, uh, a music shop where you can go and listen to monitors, I highly recommend you make the effort to get in your car and drive to the next town, get on a train uh, and go to the next town. It's, if you are going to spend your hard-earned mon money on monitors, it's worth hearing them first so you know what you're getting in for. Um, if that isn't an option, possibly you can look at like studio forums for your area and maybe there's, there's someone living in your town that has the same speakers, you might be able to organize something with them to come and have a, have a little listen and, and a demo session. Um, another way to be, be able to hear them is um, possibly look at, um, at the Hi-Fi. Now, um, I know a lot of you are cringing, but you'll find that a lot of companies like, um, like PMC, like ATC, like Atom Audio, all of these guys in building um, nice monitors uh, are also involved in the, the Hi-Fi side of things, and some of them have the exact same model, a Hi-Fi version, which is basically the same speaker with a, a wood veneer on it. Um, so you might find that um, you can actually go and listen to them just with, with a different veneer on the outside and at least you'll be able to go in and, and, and test them properly and importantly hear them before you buy them. Uh, regarding the term near field, and you, you'll hear people talking about near field monitors or mid field or mains. Back in the, the good old days of super expensive, big ass studios, you'd have Sophic mounted monitors. Sophic mounted just means that they're mounted in the walls. You'd have these huge, big, uh, beautiful speakers in it, and you know, they were great. They could go ridiculously loud, ridiculously low, so you get the really low bass response, you can hear what's going on. Um, but the problem with these speakers are, besides the fact that they're prohibitively expensive for most people, um, more and more people are working in smaller and smaller rooms. And besides the fact that you just can't fit one of these humongous expensive speakers in, in a small room, um, it's actually not always the best thing to have a ludic ludicrously low bass. So if you've got a, a small room and it's untreated, um, you really don't want to be throwing out massive amounts of like 30 hertz low bass. It's actually going to make things worse and give you a lot more trouble in getting a good mix than opposed to actually helping things. So that's where um, the near field design comes in. So the near field literally means the speaker's nearer to you. Um, and it's a, a, it's a small speaker and you don't need to have it as loud. So the theory is that it's not going to, you're not going to hear as much... Um, reflections in the room and plus being closer it's closer to your ears so you're not going to get as again as much sound bouncing off everything else in the room and uh, a midfield is kind of something in between it's a larger speaker not quite a main and it sort of sits halfway between your your meter bridge so a near field monitor is generally designed to go on your meter bridge or on your desk as, a, as it might be in my case buying monitors uh, talking about you have to hear them, you also need to hear them on music you really know well and understand. This is really important. Don't rely on the, um, what the store to have a demo CD that you know. Take music that you know very well. Um, I take uh, like a range of music as well. Um, I make predominantly electronic music, but I also have in my demos, my little demo CD, I have uh, acoustic stuff, stuff that's done with instruments, um, particularly like uh, classical and things because it's, it's quite easy to tell which sounds, uh, which sounds real on each set of monitors as opposed, compared to each other. 
um, because you know what a, what a cello or a violin should sound like. Uh, hopefully you've heard one in person or, or drums or guitars. You know that sound because there is a, uh, it, has a, it has a certain sound to it, whereas a crazy dubstep crunch mega chunk bass line uh, is going to sound uh, different on different speakers and unless you really know it well and you've heard that mega crunch bass line on a bunch of different speakers you know exactly what it sounds like it's a bit harder to tell if what you're hearing is more of a, a, a correct reproduction of that sound so I recommend having a range of music um, I do have electronic stuff as well I like for instance something like uh, Raining Blood by Concord Dawn has a bit of a tricky bass line in it you, um, it's hard to hear what the bass is doing on certain speakers, so it's quite a good test to see how revealing it is. Um, another tip for um, your demo tunes is don't go in with, don't burn a bunch of crappy MP3s to CD people. Please, if you do have it, use uncompressed, full quality music. Um, I only have one um, deviation from that rule where I uh, have done something on purpose and I'll take an uncompressed piece of music and I will render it down to like a 128-bit uh, mp3 and I'll take a snippet of the, the mp3 and a snippet of the uncompressed version and put that together and I find that's quite a good test because I uh, listen to that on different speakers and on certain monitors it will show up the information that's missing basically because the mp3 is stripping out a lot of the goodness um, and uh, on a good set of monitors you will really hear the difference between a an uncompressed piece of music and a, a, an mp3 version so that's the only time when I use a, a low quality mp3 besides that I try to use all uncompressed music. Spec sheets uh, are something that I have I'm taking less and less notice of um, kind of as I go as I go forward in my my kind of own personal development of of sound, um, early on I would look at the spec sheet and look at the exact kind of frequency response graphs and say, okay, well this monitor's got it goes down an extra you know whatever an extra ten cycles or something like that uh, a few a few hertz, um, and you know this has an extra certain amount a few more watts and. It's important to look at these stats. If you need something that goes loud, you want to make sure it's got the right amount of you know watts and that sort of thing. But it's these the the frequency response graphs. They can kind of be in numbers. They can kind of be shimmied. You can record them in different ways, um, and so you're not really genuinely comparing apples to apples in most cases when you're looking at the stats. So um, I less and less look at the, the, the numbers these days and more, um, and more listen, to, listen to them and see what they sound like. And that's, the, that's the, the, the true test. So try not to get too hung up in the, in the, uh, in the exact numbers um, on, the, on the grass because, it, like I say, it, you're not getting the whole story, basically. It, it gives you an indication of some of the physical parts, but it's... Uh, a monitor is far more than the sum of its parts. It's, it's how it comes together. It's the it's the you know the, the sound stage, the depth, the clarity, and and ready ready ra. So um, that's just me personally. But I yeah you know, I just don't really get um, too hung up on the exact um, numbers on some of the uh, graphs. Set a budget. That's an important one. Um, although I will say when people ask me about it, I do say you should probably stretch and invest in something if you if you know you're going to be doing music for a while at least you know you're going to get a couple years enjoyment out of it it's worth spending a bit more money and getting something decent rather than going halfway and then having to upgrade later now not everyone's in the position to spend more and that's fine you only spend what you can don't put yourself out of a home or anything but I do think it's something worth investing in it's something that you will get more use out of than anything and um, at the end of the day your monitors are the only thing in your entire studio that you can hear so it's really important that they are of of some kind of quality so I do think it is worth um, putting the money in and if you get a pair that you hear first and you really like then I think you'll you'll be glad you spent the money on it you definitely won't won't regret it so now I'd like to talk a little bit about our sponsors. First of all, Prime Acoustic, um, who make uh, 
fantastic acoustic solutions. I've heard them in a few different studios. Um, not only do they look good, but they're also really affordable as well. They have very kindly given us a prize to give away if you want to check it out. It looks like this. They've given us some panels. Uh, and basically, you'll be able to make your current monitors sound better just by treating some of the, the common acoustic problems that do occur in most studios. If you want a chance to win these, head down to thedspproject.com slash win for all the details of how you can enter. Next is PMC, the professional monitor company. Um, basically, I think their, their monitors sound fantastic. I love them. Um, I know what you're probably thinking, that I've decided to buy them and I'm sponsored by them, so clearly they've bought me out or whatever, but um, the fact of the matter is I actually chose uh, PMC first. I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with quite a few different uh, brands over the years and um, I, I really am a fan of the PMC brand so I went and spoke to them and said you know this is what we're doing on the show talking about monitors um, do you want to come on board and help us out and they were really cool and really supportive about it and uh, so very big thank yous go out to PMC uh, I'm a big fan uh, one of the main points you need to know about is the ATL Advanced Transmission Line technology, which we'll be talking about a bit more in future episodes. But basically with it, you're, you can get a, a lot lower base than you'd expect to get out of a, a, an ordinary cabinet of this kind of size and driver. Um, and not only do you get lower base, I've noticed, but even at lower levels, like if you turn them right down and listen to them at a quiet level, usually on any other monitor, the, 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 the sub end of it just disappears. But with the PMCs, you can still hear the detail in the, in the base section, even, uh, even at low levels. Um, and that's part of the reason why I picked them as well, is because I, I don't like subwoofers personally. I don't like trying to get the, the balance right I've had um, in a few of my studios in the past, I've had uh, different, I've tried a few different brands, I've had KRK and things, and it's just, I don't like trying to integrate these, the, the, the two different drivers, and um, yeah, it's just never, it's never really worked out for the better for me. So I like having one speaker that I can get all of the, all of the frequency range that I need out of, and uh, the PMCs give me that. So that is about all I've got for this week. If you want to join in, join us next week, we will be talking more about monitors. If you've got a question about monitoring, send an email to inbox at the dspproject.com and I'll try and include your question in this series. Uh, yep, that is definitely at this time and I'll see you next week.